Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining me today. I'm joined by Yvonne Leneuve. Did I say that right? Yeah, you did say that, actually. That's oh, good, yeah. Good, that was off the cuff. Um, mm -hmm. I'm joined by Yvonne, who I will now be referring to by his first name for the rest of the interview. And I'm really excited. So Yvonne is an osteopath, and I'm really excited to be talking to him because he's had loads of experience working abroad in other countries as an osteopath. So I'm really interested to see what he's learned and what he's bringing back Hi, Ivan. Hi, it's good to be it's, here. Yeah, thanks for joining me. It's been so long since I've actually seen any regular human beings outside of my four walls. <laughs> you know what, that makes two of us. Um, I'm in France right now and not many people are coming out anyway, so it's, uh, it's good to see a friendly face, to the least. Yeah, likewise. And so obviously we know each other because we studied together. Yes. Quite literally, we studied for FCCs together. Yes. Um, and so we both graduated from BCom in the same year. Mm -hmm. um, and what a, what a wild ride that was in itself, huh? Um, yeah, I, I, it's definitely been a long four years, but the last year being definitely the final roughest stretch with everything coming together, everything having to be done at the same time. But you know, at the end of the day, we all made it and I'd say it was worth it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> what was your experience like um, starting at BCom? So if those of you who are listening don't know what BCom is, sorry. It's the British College of Osteopathic Medicine in North London. Um, I, I really have a lot of good things to say about BCom. Um, I didn't really know much about uh, the kind of the university formats in England um, when uh, I decided to study there because I come from a, a primary um, kind of um, education in the French system. So coming to the English system, I, I really didn't know what to expect. And I was really pleasantly surprised that um, everything kind of works like uh, a family. Everyone knows each other, everyone um, helps each other. It's just, it's just a very nurturing environment where everyone wants to see everyone succeed. And um, honestly, I can't thank Become enough for how much they helped me throughout all these studies because despite it all they're not easy <laughs> they're definitely a full-time involvement that's going to suck up much of much much if not all of your life for four years so the fact that the, that the school and the people there help you so much is definitely um, huge yeah and this is not sponsored by them at all we just have really <laughs> no, nice things no. to say about them exactly and i mean how could you not say nice things about them when they, they, they've been there for you so much? You, know, you, have, you have to give credit to credit is due, it's, especially for me, whereas in the, in the system I do come from, in the French system, where how to put the student support is less encouraged, to put it nicely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know if I can say this, but the number of times that I went to um, our principal office, um, uh, the principal, Kirsten, um, her office, and just cried. I was like, yeah, things are a bit tough. And she was great. I loved it. I loved, I didn't love crying, but she, I loved her for helping me. Kirsten, Kirsten, and I hope I can say that, is an angel by all accounts. Definitely, definitely someone that deserves so, so much more of everything in her life for how much, um, for how much stuff she has to put up with Ruby Kong. Yeah. And now, so the reason why I want to talk to you is because um, I know as soon as we graduated, you 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 left the country. You had I such did, a, yes. an amazing experience away from the UK and even Europe. And I want I, I just want you to tell me more about what that entailed. Like throughout, throughout my studies, um, like I, of course I love my studies, but um, I've I've always been and I always really wanted to get out there and do some humanitarian action. Um, it's a bit more difficult when you're an osteopath and not a doctor per se. Um, the ways you can help people is a bit muddled. You have, you have to do a lot, a lot of looking around. And it just so happens that my, my aunt, well, my, my aunt by, sorry, more akin to my godmother, because there's no blood between us, who lives in Mexico, mentioned this uh, hospital from the town she was in, a hospital that uh, catered to people uh, from the streets, people that were abandoned, people that had severe conditions that prevented them from living a normal life. That hospital took those people in and she suggested, would you like to come over and see if you can help in any way? And in my eyes, it couldn't have been more what I wanted because that's, that, that's what it is essentially, you know, humanitarian, it's helping those in need. 
and um, and yeah, so I jumped at the opportunity to do so, and thankfully everything was s smooth and direct. They they wanted the help, they, they welcomed it, and before I know it, I, I was in I was in Mexico, and a few days later I was starting at the hospital. Yeah, and can you say where in Mexico you were? Or yes, so it was a small town called Marinalco, uh, about an hour and a half from uh, Mexico City. It's a roughly 6,000 to 7,000 um, population. And, uh, and yeah, that's, that's pretty much where it is. <laughs> yeah, and so it was a small town, really, if you think it about is, yeah. the, the population. And what kind of setting were you working in? So I was working in the rehabilitation block of the hospital. Um, so it was um, head, spearheaded by um, my, uh, my superior who's a physiotherapist specialized in uh, neurological rehabilitation. And uh, we, in, in Mexico, they have this concept of social service, wherein um, anyone in the uh, medical profession that finishes the study have to work in a random hospital across the country for a year. So essentially in this rehabilitation block, we have the head physio, my superior, and then a rotation of um, freshly graduated um, physiotherapists, osteopaths, and others that come and change across six months to a year. So I came in in between a changing period. So I got to work with um, two different people, both of them physiotherapists that had just finished and were doing their social service in this small hospital. That's so interesting. So once these doctors sort of qualify, they, they have to do these six month rotations. Exactly. For, for free, of course. So that, that applies for everything. So nurses, doctors, and this hospital, which is, um, was, which was founded by nuns and basically lives through donations, um, lives through those social services because they don't have the money to be paying doctors and nurses at all time at full time. So they have the advantage of the government essentially offering them um, some qualified help on a rotation basis. Okay, so you're in a hospital setting and what kind of patients were you working with? Well, the, the, the work was threefold. Uh, the most important work, uh, which um, took up most of the day every day, was the residents of the hospital, as I mentioned. So um, these people that came um, from the streets that were kicked out from uh, their houses or family, um, usually sustained some kind of accident and were under some kind of paralysis. Um, of course, there's a lot of variety, but the main, main condition I saw across those people was a geriat ge geriatric patient with um, hemiplasia. So, um, if, so for those that don't know, it uh, essentially corresponds to um, a paralysis of half the body. So at this point, um, the work would be mainly treatment of symptoms that, that arises. So any pain, um, actually mostly pain, muscles, musculoskeletal, and uh, the maintenance of the joints that are paralyzed, and of course, the rehabilitation. So practically, that means a lot and a lot of mobilization, especially those paralyzed joints. They need to be moving. They need to as active as possible and for most of them the number one goal is to walk because most if not all of these people are in wheelchairs and that's their biggest objective is to be able to walk so in that aspect my very osteopathic um, education shifted very closely to a physiotherapy a kind of application in which essentially um, I was we were working as a team of musculoskeletal, kind of adding our knowledge to help these people as much as possible. Because, and this is the big part about working in a hospital like this, um, books um, that we learn from will tell you these conditions will look like this when treated like this. But what I've found is that these people are not treated. So we picked, them, we, we picked them up in awful conditions. They, they've never received any treatment. And I don't know of the symptoms that happen to common conditions when these conditions never go treated. So every case becomes incredibly unique and requires a lot of thinking outside the box and a lot of, this is clearly not working. We have to completely vary the approach and also a lot of this is barely working, but objectively, that's all we can do. Because 
some people with hemiplasia have great prospects. They do, they do come to, to walk and have kind of a normal life again, where they, they, they just, they, they can actually survive on their own. And other cases, unfortunately, they're not going to be in a good shape for most of their life. So any help we do provide is either preventing them from getting worse, which is a very pessimistic attitude, but unfortunately, that's, that's the only kind of, that, that, that's the only prospect. And how interesting to be able to come out of, you know, BCom, having yeah. just graduated and gone into such a complex, like such a complex type of presentation to work with. Of course, of course, that's, and a lot of people I talked to were mentioning that, but really, um, and this is credit to BCom, nothing felt completely um, impossible. A lot of things were unusual, a lot of things I had no experience with, but once you took a step back, talked to my colleague, it all seemed, oh, so sure, I've never seen this to this degree or this at all, but it's actually, it's actually something I understand. I can break down, I can approach it in my osteopathic view. I'm not following, a, I, I was never, we were never given a, um, if this condition do uh, this treatment, no, it was always, um, if you see this presentation, approach it this way, and then you make up your treatment. And that's the flexibility that the education of BCOM provides you to be able to adapt your treatment to what you see and not the condition that was just given to you. To, 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 give, to, give, to give you a great example, which, uh, which sounds daunting when, once presented to you, but objectively isn't, uh, was when we had a new patient, uh, this man had uh, very severe diabetes and it was left untreated for, his whole, for almost all of his life. And as a lot of us knows, um, that can lead to a lot of terrible um, consequences. For him, it was a double, a double amputation of both his legs. And therein he comes for treatment. And at this point, I, coming from BCOM, look at this man saying, I've never treated a man that recently lost his legs. What do you expect me to do in this, in this, in this situation? But it's, it's, still, it's still the same joints, you know? Sure, you're missing a big aspect that you never saw before, but at the end of the day, you're still looking for um, maintenance of the upper body. You're still looking for decent range of movement um, in the remaining aspect of the legs and you just you just roll the punches that's just the way it is and become prepares you for that they, they give, it gives you the tool to stay objective and look at look at this as it is by the way i feel like i'm talking a lot and just kind of rambling so do so do kind of cut me off when i'm just kind of like in my own world because there's so much things to say about this so much positive things and i could genuinely go for a few hours without, without pause so do cut me off if you feel like it it's all good this is this is the whole point of this sort of series um, and podcast is to talk to people and people that i find interesting and listen to their stories um i'm just here to ask the questions really but one of the things that you said um, that i found really interesting was that you know at the heart of it you're just treating people Exactly. And they're not a textbook presentation. They're an individual with different needs, different exactly. abilities, different um, sort of um, goals. And that's, that's what you treat. You treat a person, not a condition. Exactly. You always treat the person and you, you get to know them. You get to know exactly what happened to them and what works for them and what doesn't work for them. Um, when, I, when I moved there, my Spanish wasn't excellent. I had basis and I do speak French, so it isn't the biggest stretch between French and Spanish, but I'm sure any osteopath will tell you that communication is key. So I had to rely a lot on my colleagues at first, but people communicate very efficiently um, once you open yourself to what they have to say. So they may not tell you the, the most technical terms, but they they communicate how they feel. And I feel like that almost transcends language because you, you can understand them. You can, you can see where they come from and that, that's, that's, that's everything about treatment. Yeah. And one of the things um, you mentioned earlier was that you came from this osteopathic background yes. to a new country where you didn't really know the language and you embedded into 
um, sort of a hospital service surrounded by physiotherapists. And so I can see parallels because that's essentially what I've gone through as well. Pretty much, yeah. In bear in mind, and in this country, so I spoke the language was a little bit easier for me. Mm -hmm. um, but what was your transition into sort of delivering that osteopathic approach, but in a very physiotherapy sort of setting? Well, and, and this is all credit to the people I work with. Um, they welcomed everything I said. So sure, communication was a bit difficult at first. There was a lot of notes that were taken at night, talking about in the morning, Google Translate on the moment. But um, it was just, it was, it was never about um, their treatment versus mine. It was always about our treatment for the patient. Um, a big moment, it was in my third day where I knew it was a team, was when uh, one, of the, uh, one of the staff was requiring some treatment. So um, I put this a, a bit of a bit more conventional, a uh, traumatic, tra traumatic incident which led to pain. And in this instance, we essentially combined, me and my coworker, both of our techniques together for this treatment. And we discussed, we talked about biomechanics, we talked about other joints. Um, my, my coworker was very much into electrotherapy. Um, so he showed me his notions about that. And everything just kind of came together when we had this consensus of we're working on these tissues, working on these joints, you're applying um, these um, objectives, I'm applying these objectives. And it was just, it was a give and take. And that's the most important part, part about working in a team is that you must always think of it as our treatment. It's not, um, I'm gonna provide you an osteopathic treatment and I'm gonna provide you a physio treatment because physios know how to do STT, substitute treatment, physios know how to do mobilizations and we, we do a lot of the same things, except we just look at things differently. But at the end of the day, we're tr we can treat the same things most of the time. And yeah, that's what it is. It's, it's our treatment. And honestly, I can't give enough credit to the people I worked with that were open-minded enough to accept everything I had to say, take into consideration and work around. It was always, it was always positive. It's always more information is better. You know, it's more is better in this case. Yeah, and it sounded like it was a real collaboration. Always. Different approaches rather than, you know, one approach versus another, because yeah. at least when we were studying, I think, you know, we always got this impression that it was sort of like osteos in one corner, chiropractors in another, um, physiotherapists in another, mm -hmm. and no, was, there was no overlap. And I think for me, having worked with physiotherapists, I'm like, oh, we do a lot of the same things. Yeah, we, we do objectively. And, um, and I mean, it's, I understand there's a lot of differences between where these professions come from and there is a need to kind of differentiate them because everything is unique. I don't think it's in the best interest to kind of bring in everything together because in the way we're unique is what makes us more special. But I have to, I have to insist that I'm sure that any physio and any osteopath will always tell you that they want what's best for their patient. So they'll happily say, I'm not comfortable using my technique um, on this patient because I know for a fact that your technique is more appropriate and vice versa. It's always about what's best for the patient and how well we can discuss together and how we can learn from each other for helping that person. Yeah. And just listening to you talk, I mean, I could literally let you, as you say, ramble on. I don't think it's rambling at all because you speak very coherently. Um, Thank you. <laughs> but I just, I just remember having some of these conversations, you know, when we were studying together in the clinic room and just, and it's just such a pleasure to hear about how all this wealth of experience has come together for you to really shape your practice, essentially. Yeah, and I mean, it's, um, it's just, it, it's everything at BCOM. That's, that, 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 was, that, that was the beauty. It was because we had those different inputs, those different experiences from all of our tutors because never in a million years would you say that um, someone like, uh, uh, like Lazarus or someone like um, Shaw would be working in the same way. They'd be treating similar patients, yes, but their approach to things would be so radically different. And in that same respect, I can see, I can, I can say that the difference between Lazarus and Urshaw 
would be very similar to a difference between a very um, biomechanical uh, osteopath versus a much more, um, um, how to put, I'd say this, um, ultrasound based um, physiotherapist, you know, like we're, we're, all, we're all doing our things and we all have our personality about it because it, there's just so much of it. Yeah. And so were your expectations after graduating what you expected? 100%. I, um, I knew exactly what I was getting into um, when I started um, at BCom. And once I finished, it was exactly um, what I expected and how, how I was going to uh, proceed. Um, the only things I thought was diff were different, and this is a positive, is that I didn't realize that osteopathy was going to take such an important place in England. I see it growing. I see more places recognizing it, accepting it. So I'm pleasantly surprised that my expectations are going to be even more than matched about the way it's been um, integrated into the NHS, possibly, and into general culture, essentially, in the, in the UK. So, so yeah, become... Be, be, become did well by their the advertisements at the least <laughs> yeah because i remember speaking to you even before we had graduated and you were very clear about where you were going to go and what you were going to do whereas if i can say most of us were just yeah some of us had jobs lined up and things like that but a lot of people yeah. including myself were kind of floundering were like well i'm just going to get through these sort of exams mm -hmm. and then i'll figure it out as i go along really but you of were course. very clear with what you wanted well, it's, 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 it's putting it quite, uh, quite grandly, to be honest, because um, I, I, there's so much about osteopathy I love. And at, at the main core, um, if I can be more specialized in, this, in, in, in a part of it, I will. But if, if it just so happens that my, my, that my life leads me to working in a small village as the osteopath village and seeing the same kind of patients, I'd still be very happy because... I came into this profession to help people because I really believe in the power of osteopathy to help people. So as long as I'm helping people, the, the rest is just extra. It's important, but it's, it's still extra. Yeah. And what kind of specialties in osteopathy are you interested in or would you like to specialize in? Well, from my, from my recent experiences, uh, geriatrics is definitely something I'm looking a bit into because I, it's just something I, I've had so much so much good experience it's good experience with I, I i can't say enough good things about um older people and the relationship they have with their therapist it's just something so so gratifying and significant for them because sure a lot of people of all ages will have a traumatic experience pain they'll be in and out five treatments but some older people you'll be an integral part of their life no you won't be just a pass just um something that someone that passes by and helps them. No, no, you'll be an in in integral part of how they feel from day to day and how they can evolve. And for me, that's just amazing, you know, to be such an important part of someone's life just by wobbling a few limbs around and listening to them, to them talk. <laughs> well, I think you do more than that, but I know what you mean. Um, I know what you know what you mean, but yes. <laughs> yeah, and actually, in fact, um, Shireen runs the... Um, older adult or geriatric masters at um, BSO or UCO now that it, it, it's been rebranded. Um, they have changed. So yeah. that's, it's just reminding me of something that um, you said about working with geriatric patients. And so, mm. yeah, maybe something to, to look into. Yeah. And, and of course, as well, pediatrics. Pediatrics at DCOM. Um, the only thing I have to fault is that we, there wasn't enough of it, of course. I know it's not DCOM's fault because it's, it's very difficult to organize and there just, just isn't enough staff to, go to, to allow people to do pediatrics all year long. But pediatrics, I, I personally found to be incredible. And uh, th this is going to be on the rambly aspect as well, because I do have a story relating to that in Mexico. It was, it was my only geriatric, um, pediatric pa patient there. And it was um, this, this little boy that was four years old. I, I do warn that I say this story really happily because it's a positive experience. But if you look a, a very hard into it, it does make people quite sad because it is a sad story. But just keep a positive shine on it. I just, I, I've told this story before and I've had people being really bummed out about it. So I'm just giving a small heads up. Get the tissues ready, people. Essentially. So it was this uh, the small boy we, um, we got. He was essentially um, adopted 
um, as a legal guardian by one of the nuns that um, co-owned the hospital. And um, his mother died at birth. His father gave him up uh, because uh, the father was um, a drug addict that couldn't cater for him. And as we got him, we, re we realized that he had hydrocephalus that was never treated. And that comes back to um, how do you treat something that in modern countries is always treated? Well, it, it's not very pretty. This, this little boy that was four years old had the body of a one-year-old boy and the cognitive abilities of a six months old. So at four years old, couldn't talk, couldn't move coherently, couldn't, you, by all accounts, he was a six months old baby in a four year old body because of all the fluid that I accumulated inside his head. His head was a lot less um, bigger than he thought it would have been, but it was still quite considerate. And, um, and treating him was, it was, it was incredible because we knew it was going to be an uphill battle from the start. We knew that this boy with great treatment would walk at 12 years old if and only if we were lucky and everything would go perfectly. But he was, that boy was so, he was so happy. It's, it's stupid to say, but he was so happy. It was the best part of his day to just, of our day, to just like be on the, um, on the treatment beds, on all fours, making him move as much as possible, mobilizing him and having him giggle at the most, <laughs> the most stupidest of things. Or it, was, it was just incredible because we only treated him for, I only got the, the chance of treating him for a month. And from one month only, we saw him going from not being able to move his head to having full range of movement. This, this boy essentially is, is, is healing, even though he's been plagued by something for four years. And of course, I'm never going to see this in the UK, I hope, thank, thank God. But that's the part of pediatrics, which is equally impressive, is the clear and really pronounced difference that you bring to these tiny little people. And yeah, it's magical. It's just, there's, there's just no, word, no other words to it. Yeah, and how powerful to be able to have that impact on, on a child so exactly. early on. Exactly, because, and I have to state this, it is, it is a six-month-old child. For him, this is everything, and you could, maybe this is just me having hopeful thinking, but you can tell that he loves the environment. I can't speak for the environment he was in before, because God knows we don't know in what kind of conditions he was held, but in this environment, he's, he's objectively a happy child. He is everyone's, he's, a, he's everyone's little brother. He's, um, yeah. So what kind of other type of work have you been involved with? So um, still within the hospital, um, I mentioned the patients that were residing in it and we were providing daily treatments for, but there was also some patients coming outside the hospital. I think, I think you can say health patients. I'm not sure what's the vocabulary on that. Yeah. Uh, so that was diagnosing and treatment. So much closer to what happened to become equally rewarding because Surprisingly enough, the types of patients that come into the Begum clinic are somewhat different than the type of patient that come in from a small Mexican village in the middle of nowhere, who would have known. So, <laughs> so great experience, but not as different. Uh, the, the, the main worry that I want to mention, which was absolutely amazing, was again part of the hospital, was going to a prison, two different prisons in fact, um, once every two weeks, so twice a month, uh, once to a minimum security prison and once to a maximum security prison. So I did that for two months or four times total. And, and let me tell you, that's probably something I'll be, uh, I'll be talking about for the rest of my life because um, everyone tells me, oh, you went to a prison. That must have been terrifying. You know, these, these are supposed to be bad people. You don't know what they've done. But who am I to judge what they've done? I'm not, I'm not here to, to give morality lessons. I'm here to help them out with their pain. So that's what they saw. That's what, that's what I came with. That's what they saw. And they were, the, they were some of the nicest people I ever talked to. They, they were so happy. They were so generous. They, 
they came in with such clear kind of respect to for what we did and we just had a blast honestly it was it was our whole team three of us that just saw maybe i don't know 50 patients across six hours really three patients always being seen running running i must have performed 20 HPTs that day on fairly bigger man, but it was great, honestly. Like I do, I cannot recommend this enough to people that just started is that do something that's different, you know, that's, that's as different as it can get. And it's as good as you're ever going to feel because it's, it's so much help you're providing to these people. So in a way it really took you out of your comfort zone. Exactly. Yeah. And, that's, that, that goes for anything in your life, go out of your comfort zone. You'd be surprised how happy, you'd be, how happy you'll be outside of it. I think that really comes back to sort of the, the, the core values of the way you treat. You treat, again, like I said before, you treat the person first exactly. and foremost. And I think that really, and I hope that, you know, comes across to everyone listening because that's definitely what I get from you. And especially from when we were studying together, I remember, you know, you really... It was a very patient-centered approach that you use because even with pediatrics, I remember, and I think you were the first one in our in our whole year to do this. Um, you would bring in toys for the kids and stickers, <laughs> and I thought, I didn't even think of that. That's such a good idea. <laughs> but it was a way of of building this rapport with the with the children it that is, nobody yeah. else was thinking about. So you've always put that at the forefront. That's what I really admired of you and tried to sort of learn and steal maybe because i did that then i took some stickers in it's it, it, it's never stealing like for the, for the for the rest of my life i will happily say on camera recorded the things i do how i do them because i want everyone to be able to do the same if they find it interesting because that's that's what it is it's about helping people it's about experiences because you never know what kind of advice people might need at some point in their life you know you might i mean i know I know I can think of so many things I learned from watching you and from studying with you and they come back for me from point to point and I'm just thinking oh yeah I'm doing it this way but I remember Silva I'm doing it in a different way and it was just so much more logical and it just comes into your mind that's that's the that's the connection we all share isn't it yeah and plus I also made things up as I went along so I don't know I had no clue what I was doing every tutor will tell you that they make things up it's 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 just part of the job, you know. Like if if we only treated arthritis on one meter eighty, seventy five kilogram people all day long, then yeah, sure, our techniques might look the same. But as far as I'm concerned, that's not the case. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for this. Yeah, <laughs> something you said earlier was you know you learned loads, and so this is the whole reason why I wanted to work on the series with people who had graduated or newly graduated was if I had been able to access some kind of resource about all these stories about other people in their first year of practice, especially, and just learn from what they did and what they didn't do and what they learned, I think it'd be a complete different way of, of appreciating what I was entering. Cause I had no idea what I was getting mm -hmm. myself into. I was just trying to get through VCOM and then I was going to figure it out. But for you, what have you what what have you learned in, in your first year of practice since graduating um what have i learned uh well the first thing i've learned is and as cliche as this may sound is that there is so 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 much to what we do physical therapy including it one thing that there's so much to everything and so much merit to everything and that's <laughs> you could spend a million years talking to however many people learning how many things and it'd still be some stuff that you just don't know about and that i know for sure is that it's it's i'm never going to be bored of this i i know that there's always going to be some new different things some new different approaches and that become did an amazing job at giving us just a small facet of what we do because because gave us a lot of stuff a lot of um, small notions and big notions about so many subjects and now that I'm in it 
uh, sorry, when I was at Become, I thought, do we really need all of this? Is this really, uh, isn't this a bit too much? And then now that I'm outside of it, I realized, wow, it was, it wasn't a lot. It was just the bare minimum. And even then there's just so much. And that's, that's amazing. It just, I've, I've learned that there is so much more to love about what you do once you're in it, doing it and helping people. And that the more open-minded you are, the more you're going to grow objectively. <laughs> yeah. And what do you think you would have liked to have known when graduating that then in comparison to, to now, maybe? Um, <laughs> what would I have liked to have known? Frankly, um, how free you are. It's, uh, it's, kind of gyre, it's kind of jarring to start working on your own and think to yourself, wow, there's so much stuff I can do now. Because when you're at BCom, it's structured and you really do have to follow quite a lot of boxes. And it's not a criticism because you have to follow boxes because you have to grade people. So of course, that's perfectly fine. Once you're free, it's nice to see that, wow, it's nice that there's so much more to it again. And that it would have been nice for someone to tell me, you do the boxes now, you take the boxes, you, you, you prove um, how good you are at the basic things. But once you're done, you can do whatever you want. And even then, there is one or two tutors that, 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 that did allude to that. I do remember, I can't quite remember his family name, Mr. Manley, the... Uh, the tutor that uh, went into the Navy, a very quirky man, Mansfield. Mansfield, of course, Mansfield, that said again and again, and it resonates to me even more now, um, you start doing osteopathy once you leave BCom in the same way that you, you, know, you start driving once you get your driving license. And I didn't realize how insightful that was because that is exactly what it is. You create some aspect of your style at BCom, but truly once you're outside of it, you're yeah, you become yourself. And that's just so fulfilling. Yeah, and we were pretty lucky with the tutors that we had because, you know, we had tutors who had more experience in classical osteopathy, some who had more experience in visceral, some were more structural, some were very sort of gyne and obstetric um, orientated. And I remember that last year just trying to be a sponge, just exactly. trying to get as much information as I could because I was <laughs> never going to be surrounded by so many different specialists in their areas exactly people that pop their field as well yeah absolutely mm -hmm. and it's interesting because obviously you know that last year is it's quite tough you know you've got a dissertation to write and it's very tough to prepare for and all these other modules like mm -hmm. you know we had pharmacology and soft tissue earlier in in the years and but now we have gyne we have uh <laughs> what, what, what even though what even though we have um pathology diagnosis geriatrics like, yeah just oh dermatology so dermatology of course yeah can't forget dermatology <laughs> i used person's dermatology notes to diagnose a rash on my arm did you and you know i do find myself going back to her notes quite a bit as well and geriatrics as well to just kind of think and think to myself hmm could this symptom fit into um, maybe a dementia kind of situation, you know, like it's, it's amazing because they're, they're golden, these notes, you know, they're like a really condensed hub of information that you can always come back to. Yeah. And like you said before, it's just a little sort of droplet and then you go off and you learn more about it. And yeah. it doesn't necessarily have to happen when you're studying because there is no time to do any other stuff. Of course not. No, no, it's just, and, and just it's always it's always the things you never expect to see that you that you see as well, and that's that's also a thing that outside of BCom you hear, hear about and you think to yourself, oh, um, I've known about this disease. There's only one person in five hundred thousand that gets it. There's no way I'm going to encounter it in my career. And what do you know? Of course you do. And that's just that's great because BCom told you about this. BCom told you about all of these diseases. I mean, I remember reading about um, ankylosing spondylitis, AS, and how it was really mentioned quite a lot. And then I looked at the statistics and think to myself, it's not, it's not that common, is it? Like, uh, why are we spending that much time on something which isn't as common as the other stuff? And what do you know? Barely a month ago, um, I was helping a friend of my family, AS. 
diagnosed through um, diagnosed through um, their local GP for X-ray and everything. And then I thought to myself, wow, become called it. I'm I'm not even six months out, and they called it. <laughs> well, I mean, they provided the information, but I think you called it. You know, you oh, yeah. So give credit where it's due. Of course, of course, yeah. But I mean, it's just so it's just so great to see that all of these things that they prepared you for, they prepared you for rightfully so. <laughs> yeah. Because when you're in it, you, you can't see it. You never see that. Yeah. And it, so it sounds like, you know, since graduating to now, your practice and your therapeutic technique and your mannerisms have changed so much. How would you like it to change or where do you see it changing towards in say like the next five years? Um, I would like to implement um, a few um, other aspects to my therapy as I go along. Um, as I mentioned, um, the, the physiotherapist I was working with was um, specialized in electrotherapy. And I firsthand saw the effects of, of um, electrotherapy, not only on patients, but also on myself. Because, well, how many of us can actually say they had that kind of treatment and know how they felt? And I was blown away by it. And I saw even more so the combination of my treatment, this treatment, and how many layers there were to it. So currently, I am looking for um, CPD, um, more courses to kind of augment my own um, treatment because it's so, how to put this, it's so little. It's so, I don't, I, I don't want to discredit or say that it isn't the complicated but it's you buy a machine, you know how it works, and you incorporate it into your treatment. It adds 10 minutes and it's so much benefit, you know? So that's an aspect of my treatment I really wanna to elevate to the next level because I can see that it's practical and it works and that's just great. Yeah. And, 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 and yeah, that's, that's, that's a big part of it. And of course, it's my, it's, it's, it's all of my other techniques that kind of came together in a more coherent way. My HVTs, my mobilizations, my soft tissues, they, they all became more refined, more precise. And it, it's just so hard to explain why everything just kind of comes together in a more coherent way. Yeah. Are there any other types of CPD courses or events or books that, you know, get you excited? Um, everything has to do with geriatrics and pediatrician, you know, every course that mentions more techniques, more, more of everything. Um, I want to be there and I want to listen to it because there's a lot to it and it just, it interests me. And, and honestly, you could, you, you could say that about so many courses because people ask you about everything. Like I've never been too inclined towards visceral but people ask me about this role regularly and i think to myself well shouldn't i do a course on it you know shouldn't i look into it shouldn't i do more because clearly it's somewhere where i can help people yeah and so, how powerful is that to be able to know, right to do that for a living day in day out exactly and just to, to evolve constantly never be always in your own kind of like stagnant being and that know that it not just to just know that at the end of the day you're going to be learning for the rest of your life and that's probably the best part yeah you'll never be bored that's for sure exactly and that's the best part mm -hmm. so do you have like a piece of advice you'd give to somebody um graduating this year or next year even or even someone who's looking into getting into the profession well um it, it, it is funny you should mention that because I do keep in contact with people and that are in third or going to fourth years and they do ask me these questions. And um, if, um, I, I say, um, if, you're, if you're about to graduate, if, you, if, it's, if it's getting to that point where you know what I'm talking about, it's, it, it's, it's crush time, you know, you've been in it for so long, you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, everything, is a bit muddled maybe you have a lot of knowledge and you're just a bit lost i just want to say to these people that things do make sense at some point it might not be one week after you graduate it might actually it might actually be halfway through your third year for your fourth year but everyone i know and for myself there's always been a moment where everything just kind of made sense it just clicks and i'm sure it comes to that for everyone 
<laughs> so it's for these two four, I just want to say, I know it sucks right now, but things get better. You just got to keep on going at it, keep on um, trusting your own gut and just doing what you want to do, because that's the privilege of our profession is that you have choices. You can do what you want, how you want it within, just within reason, but, <laughs> but you can create your style. And that's something that you should strive towards. Always having your style and your aspirations above everything else whilst keeping open mind. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. And I really want to thank you for joining me today to talk about your experiences, you know, in Mexico and how that shaped you and what you brought with it. Um, I could talk to you for ages and not get bored. I'm glad to hear that. But thank you very much for having, for having me. Um, this whole situation has kind of taken us a bit away, me personally, away from osteopathy. So just to be able to talk about it feels really nice, you know, because it just really consolidates how much I love what I do and that I could definitely talk about it all the time because, because yeah, osteopathy, osteopathy is pretty, it's pretty great. <laughs> and on that note, I can't think of any other way to end this today on that perfectly salient note. So thank you so much, Ivan. You're welcome.